Hey everybody, welcome to season 5 of What's IGN Crushing On? I'm Karen Welby Solomon and I'm your host, and we're here to talk about what's hot in pop culture. Today's episode is brought to you by Syntec. Syntec is a technology company that sources and distributes industry leading products and brands from around the world. Welcome to episode 3 of season 5. We have an amazing show for you, but firstly, let's welcome back Leanne. Hi, Leanne. Hello, Karen Ann. How are you? I'm good, and you? I'm good, I'm good. Did you survive your week? I survived my week, thank the Lord. Today on the show, we we have the cast and crew of Netflix's first Afrikaans series, Ludic. So, it's a jam-packed show. We also spoke to Arnold Forslew, who you will remember from lots and lots of TV shows growing up. But, you know, those of us that are fans of 90s Brendan Fraser will also remember him mm-hmm. from The Mummy. We also spoke to other cast members such as Rob Van Furen, Jean de la Rue, Sean, My- Sean Cameron Michael, Tina Redman, Inga Beckman, Diane Lawrenson, Zane Mies, Shamani Sebe, as well as the writer and creator of the show, Paul Bais, and the producers of the show, Anele Madoda and Frankie Detoy. It was a lot of people and there's a lot of things coming, but we will talk more about Ludic a little bit later. Also on the show, this week on the show, we'll be discussing the news about Issei's first bachelor being homeless, as well as Nepo Baby, Brooklyn Pulse Beckham's 70 tattoos that he dedicated to his wife. And then Leanne and I are going to talk about our most iconic Afrikaans TV characters to stay in line with them. With our African strong episode today, I just try to say <laughs> I use I to use English words in an Afrikaans accent. I don't know if you heard that, <laughs> but uh, I thought that was quite of a good a, a good attempt. Very um, good. It was like I was listening to Rian Kreivach and all over again. <laughs> I, I was gonna try and say it in Afrikaans, but I didn't want to. Um, Put myself through that and put the <laughs> listeners to that as well. As well. But um but I'm, I'm actually I'm getting quite good at Afrikaans now. Um when when I was um overseas, my parents and I spoke to each other a lot in Afrikaans so that other people would not understand what we were saying. Um mm. so we could gossip. But then but knowing my luck, I was also very nervous that like the one person that understands Afrikaans would be like behind us and be like um, like what did you say? So, um, Murphy's law, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But let's talk about this news about Lee Thompson. So, South Africa's first, so over the weekend or week, whatever, the news broke that South Africa's first bachelor, Lee Thompson, was living in a homeless shelter in Cape Town. Which, not to shame the homeless, you know, people fall in difficult times, and you know, we got to respect that. But it's obviously shocking because, you know, Lee is who he is and he's a public figure and we were just, people were not expecting this. But, um, yeah. I think what was wild to me, okay, so I, you sent me this link and I was just like, so you what now? And it's, <laughs> it's wild because, like you said, no, no shame. Like the last two years have been tough on a lot of people and, It's been really hard. But I think what was interesting was the news broke that he was homeless and then fans went to his Instagram and like homeboy is still posting influencer shots in a store talking about activewear. So I'm just like, but now what is the truth? Like if he's homeless, why is he still, not why is he still, but you're still being influencer vibes? So like... What's going on is my question. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, and I can't also admit to, to knowing more than I do. The news spoke this weekend on Netflix 24. Um, and I think Heiskunot broke it. And I, so I obviously read the U version in English. 
But I mean, I, I could believe that maybe he had a bank of content that he's still posting. I mean, you know, he could still have a phone and be buying data and that kind of things. But um, apparently, according to the article, we will link to it in our show notes for those who would like to read. Um, he was staying at a guest house in in Cape Town CBD, which he paid 300 rand a night for. But um, the owner of the guest house told journalists that he the, he left the place in such a mess. There's photographs of it if you would like to see. But he left the place in such a mess, and they had he didn't pay, and that he evicted. And then he came back to the place after he was evicted, and he was like still came let himself in, and it was a struggle to get him out. And then when when you spoke to like other homeless people, they said that he they had seen him on the streets and they'd seen him at the shelter, and he apparently came up to one of them and asked them like. To show him, to show him, like how to to make it on the streets, basically. Oh wow! Okay, because so this is not um, like a oh we were reporting because I mean the article ended by saying they didn't really they've reached out to him or they they trying to get a hold of the family or whatever. So like it's it's a little bit of speculation, but like we don't really know. But like this is this is like real for real type of thing. Yeah. Um. So so this this man he said that. Lee was sleeping outside, but then the police picked him up and took him to a homeless shelter. So then he was staying at the homeless shelter. That um, was wild. But he wasn't so because he he was in he was like a fitness dude, wasn't he? He was a fitness instructor, and I know he had a couple of TV gigs, and I know he was involved in one of those like specialized gym situations. Um, yeah, I don't know if his businesses just didn't fall through because I, I, I mean, I'm aware that when stars like these go on Mnet shows, they give them like psychiatric help, they give them mm. like financial advice and all that kind of things. But also, you know, it's been so many years since he's been on there, so I don't know if he's taken to the financial advice if it's not going well, if he owes someone money, if there's some there's some other situation going on. I'm not sure, and I'm not, you know. It could be any of these things. But so he had, I mean, this is also pure speculation. So a couple of maybe, I want to say a, a couple of year months or a year or so ago, he announced that he wrote a book about, a tal or book, about his experience on The Bachelor. Mm-hmm. And people apparently, uh, I mean, I, I, I saw this on Instagram, but people apparently pre-booked the book, but no book came out. And oh. he... And he said that, like, Mnet was trying to stop the book from coming out. They were paying him. And Mnet said that, no, they were not. Um, they were not paying him any money. And Well, this it, is my thing. Because when you go on a reality show, do they pay you? I just thought you, like, they do on pay. the show. No, they do pay you. So th- so if you go on a reality show and say you're away for three months, that's two mm-hmm. months that you're not working. So oh, they like a pay stipend you, type five. Yeah, so yeah. they sort of, like, pay you to keep up, like... You, know, you have to pay your rent, you have to pay those kind of things that you're not going to be there for. But they don't necessarily like pay you money. They will help you get endorsements and that kind of stuff. But that after that period, it's up to you to, to make like, it work. You know, make it mm. work. So I don't know if this book exists that he wrote or if it was just like a way to make money. We don't know. There's a lot of rumors about him flying around that we can't, like, I can't con- confirm or deny. But mm. I mean, it's just it's a hectic story. Um and obviously we live in a city where there's so many homeless people. And may yeah. you know, you know, I hope that he gets a help that he deserves, like the help that he needs, clearly. Um mm. but also I hope that maybe this also draws attention to how quickly people can go from being affluent or being stable to becoming homeless in this country. I mean I mean <laughs> Yeah. Imagine, imagine the, people who don't have the exposure he has, doesn't have the the money that he had from before. I mean, he was a top model. He was a rugby player. Um, imagine how easy it is for them. You lose your job, and and all of a sudden you don't have, you can't pay your your rent. You don't have. You can't like, you know, you yeah. know, you can't pay for food and stuff like that. It's so easy to become homeless, and that's another situation that we are sitting with. Um, but yeah, I'm also. The only thing we can talk about Lee is what what is available for consumption by the media. But mm. um, you and Hayskenut um, have done in, like 
investigative journalism. They did cop launch level research. Into this. <laughs> so, I mean, I do think it's true. I do think he is homeless, um, but he is still on Instagram and he still has enough. At least he has money for daughter. <laughs> um, at least he's making it by, you know. But yeah, yeah. I mean, the article alluded to family. I just I find it so so bizarre when when you have people around you. Um, or you you have family and you you aren't able to reach out for help or or get the help you need like that's that's sad. Well, yeah, but I mean, we also we don't know what he's been going through. If like they know mm. about what he's 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 struggling with, or also if you know if he it might sounded not even like they were distant. exhausted. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> but you know, shame. I hope that people aren't also like bothering you by necessity, like. You know, try to get into the the sh- the shelter to see him or whatever, <laughs> and, and like fans. I'm getting out. Yeah, fans like at fans. the shelter. Fans, Jay, fans I shouldn't fans laugh, buy, but like fans it's just it's... buy a book. I'm I'm flabbergasted at this. This book that's not even out, but you are doesn't even have a proper publishing company, but you are are, are pre buying it. Why are you doing that? And what? What mystery could be so exciting in this book that you would want to pay for it before it's out? I don't know, man. I don't know. Celebrity is weird, I suppose. I mean, we we. I mean, this is a podcast about pop culture and following the lives of mm. celebrities or following the lives of people that we are curious about. So, I suppose everyone's got their own their own celebrities that they want to follow and if uh, if lee thompson is their vibe then i i mean go for well i mean you might that, that pre-book that money that they gave for the to pre-buy those books that funded his lifestyle it seems like for the last couple of months yeah um, so you know good luck to him and good luck to whatever's coming next but on that note, we, let's go on to our second topic, which is a little bit lighter and not talking about the homeless crisis in South Africa. But um, Brooklyn Beckham, the son of David Beckham and Victoria Beckham, um, he he recently married Nicola Paltz and took on her surname as well. And she took on his. They have a combined mm. surname. The news came out this week that apparently of his 100 or over 100 tattoos, 70 of it, is dedicated to Nicola. You don't how know, they only got married been... this year. Yeah, I would be like, how long have they been dating? I don't think it's that a long. Lot of ink. Like, 70. And, I mean, I guess some of it you can, like, pretend that it's, like, not her. But, like, he has her eyes. He has the entire wedding vows like his entire wedding vows to her tattooed on his arm or body. And I, I just said arm, but it looks like an arm. He has like, it's just like, it's a necessary man. Like, <laughs> I shame it's, a, it's his no, see, of love. You can tell her he loves her. You can buy her roses. Like, how do you have so much space on your body? Like that eyes okay, were not small. So it's like big ass been... eyes. They've been dating for just over two years in April. And he is what, 20? 19? 21? 23. Okay, 23. I mean... I I just love the story of the eyes because the minute you said it, I thought of um, Zayn who had gotten Gigi's eyes tattooed across his chest. And I was like... It's like the way people say, I love you now. Like, do I have to get eyes tattooed on me? Um, no. <laughs> but also, <laughs> that's one tattoo that Zane has to remove. If Brooklyn and Nicola do not make it, if they one day decide to split, this boy has to spend probably a y- over a year in, in laser therapy, whatever, removing those tattoos. And as Pete will tell you, it is very painful because isn't like he had like over he was like, getting all of his tattoos removed recently. So I love he it. Was, I love it that you always find a way to shut up into the conversation. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that, but we're talking about tattoos, and it's a natural segue. Okay, okay, um, but, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so Brooklyn has over seventy tattoos of his wife. Um. 
I still think yeah, this wedding I, was ridiculous. And, and I think I, I, mean, I have not been paying attention to all of it. Um, I think the only thing that kind of crossed my path with regards to the Beckhams and whatever is the rumoured feud between Nicola and Victoria, which I found interesting. Well, not interesting, but I was just like, oh, obviously people would put, I mean, I don't know how true it is or how not true it is because tabloids be tabloids, yo. But yeah, just a, an interesting way of how we monitor people's lives for any inkling of drama. Um, yeah, fascinating. Yes. So, I mean, if one day the that feud becomes an issue and they decide to split it up, my boy's <laughs> going to have 70 tattoos. And as the way, I'm, I'm looking at Brooklyn Beckham's face right now and I can see him getting another 30 more tattoos on the color. <laughs> I know I the photo I saw. Him. He's still he's still got a lot of open skin to go, man. So uh, he's yeah. his face is he's gonna have Nicola across his forehead. She does I have see. actually quite nice eyes, though. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I kind of get it. Um, <laughs> but so today we're talking about like Afrikaans and iconic Afrikaans series because of Ludic, because Netflix finally has an Afrikaans original series. And on that note, I want to ask you. What is your, like, who is your, um, like, your favorite, who is your most iconic Afrikaans TV character? So, so this one's tough because I, I didn't really watch Afrikaans TV um, until mm. about grade 10. And then someone said the best way to study Afrikaans is to watch it. And Seven watch, yeah. was the obvious choice. Um, and then I got absorbed into Seven Um so I think one of my standout characters would either have to be Sandra Statterheim because mm. she was like OG bad bitch. Um, yeah. Like on South African TV, she was amazing. Um, or, I mean, and I know it's, it's a little bit biased because she's on the podcast, but Paula van der Lek was amazing as a character. Like you hated her, you loved her, you rooted mm. for her, you wish she, she would fail. Like it was just, her arcs in Sierra Leone were amazing in terms of, of how they built and, and foul and, and yeah. her run on the show. So, yeah, I think those would be two. I mean, if you're saying iconic TV characters, I mean, we chatted about this briefly before before we started talking, but I never watched Sigoli. Like, I wasn't lucky enough to have open time. Um, I mean, to have Imnet uh, without open time. But if you're going to say iconic Afrikaans characters, I think Shaleen... Sirti Richards definitely mm. gets a shout out. Um, she was iconic as as the character in in Ecoli. So yeah, those those would be my my top guesses. Yours? So I used to watch a lot of 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 Afrikaans TV because my parents quite like Afrikaans TV, and mm-hmm. um, mainly probably because you know apartheid and they never had much options, but. Mm. Um, but of course, watch Seven Nulan Obsessed was watching for many years. But I would say my iconic Afrikaans TV character, the character that that I will always go to, is my girl Liveksi. Like she <laughs> has been through the most. Every episode they're shitting on her, they do it like, you know, she's struggling with something and she makes it out the other side. And like her name is Lafinia, but nobody calls her Lafinia. She even says in the song, my, wait, uh, my name is Lafinia, my, my name is Like, just call the, the girl by what she wants to be called. Like, she was the OG of, like, let me name myself. Don't, don't name me for me. Like, I know I'm a nice witch, but, like, do you have to call me nice witch all the time? Um, love Liveexi. Also voiced by another... I, by um oh, I don't know what her real name is, but the actor who plays um Hilda in, in Oh Zivadon. yes. Um she she voiced Liva Yixi. I hope I'm right with that actually. That's an unfounded claim that I am saying. Liva Yixi voice. Let's let's Google this quickly. Sorry, listeners, Liva Yixi voice. I'm mm. like you, Werner Vals was the Liva Yixi voice. <gasps> Rian Kreivagen was Koning Roeskrans. Ro- okay. Um, so no, the lady who played Hilda actually voiced Heidi. That's what I was thinking of. Who's another iconic Afrikaans character. 
But Levi Exi was also cool because if you were an avid reader of You and Hayes Genoot, she was also the comic in there. So you could read the comic, you can watch the show, and it was like South African animation or stop motion. And, uh, you know, I just I just thought she was such a iconic character that when you say her name, loads of people still remember her from the kids' show. And I mean, and I feel like for a probably niche audience, you know, people who, who, who watch Afrikaans on TV, yeah. this, this character has stood the test of time. I've since watched not episodes, like clips on YouTube. And mm. it, I mean, it hasn't aged well because it's like, it does not look <laughs> as great. But, you know, I still like, I remember so much about it. So for me, my iconic Afrikaans character has to be Yoka Livexi. I'm going to say it's it's weird to me. I don't think I've ever seen an episode of Livexi. <laughs> I do not remember this thing being a thing. And every time people spoke about it, I thought it was for like people older than me. <laughs> I don't like an adult was I? where was it no like it's always like people like 40-ish that talk about BVXC so I just assumed um, that by the time I was watching TV it was off air so now I'm like wait did I just like miss out on a whole segment of like children's TV um so, so it was like a radio show that was developed in like the 60s but Oh, did eventually come on like SABC. Oh, it also it was in, in 1978, but I feel like it okay. repeated on SABC continuously. Okay. So, so it was I just avoided a few coins until <laughs> seven one, basically, is what happened. <laughs> yeah, I'm like 1978, but um but yeah. So I just want to I just want to segue to Ludic and tell you a little bit more about it. So I was lucky enough to watch the episodes of Ludic before it premieres on Netflix this Friday. But it tells the story about this man named Ludic, or that's his surname. He wants to save a kidnapped family member and he's an enterprising furniture tycoon. But he has to use his secret diamond smuggling operation to transport guns across the border in order to save his relative. Um, I know that doesn't give away much, but that's exactly what you should go into the show with. When I went into watching the show, all I knew was that Arnold Fosslew plays a rich man. I knew nothing else. I don't know who was who, uh, who played what. And as the show came, like, went in, I just started, like, unraveling elements of the story as it should be, like, with the show, mm. like, without knowing anything in between. And it's very much like a thriller Ludic himself is a very complicated character because he, you know, he's he's a bad guy in a sense because he's smuggling diamonds, like, you know. And but you also root and... for him. Yeah, and he's a bit aggressive. But you also root for him because you're like, you kind of want him, you know, he's the, the goodest of the baddest, of the bads. Mm. There's a lot of bads, but he's the goodest of the bads. And it's an amazing ensemble of actors um, that play the roles they are you know, you will know them. They are from Afrikaans television throughout the years. And it's kind of, as much as I love Afrikaans television, it kind of feels like, you know, they, they're finally free because yeah, they're on a show where they can show sex. Oh, not show sex, but like, you know, show some aspects of sex, which we don't usually see on Afrikaans television. Yeah, They can show murder. It's, there's, it's, there's some scenes that are quite graphic. They can swear. I was just like, oh, this thing swear words. What? Um, <laughs> it's not the, it's not like that conservative Afrikaans stuff. Yes. We, we so I actually really see. Yeah. So I spoke to um to in our second interview with the women, I spoke to Dian and Inga about this. Dian plays um Ludic's wife, and Inga his his assistant or secretary type thing, and both of them have quite like hectic scenes that you wouldn't you. Like you wouldn't have seen that before on on your public broadcaster shows, but um, and they talk about how conservatism in the Afrikaans community and how it actually you know shows this shows more how people are, you know we don't like whereas that tends to show like a very conservative side. This is not like oh the opposite of that as as Inga says. This sort of shows how. How people actually are. There's co people are complex. There's different layers to people, and mm. the show deals quite a lot also with toxic masculinity in the Afrikaans community and how that affects males. Um, 
and like 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 fathers with sons brothers with each other um you know you know saying this is how a man should be and how it affects you know men that aren't like that and it's done beautifully especially through uh, Rob van Furen plays a character called Swiss and the way it develops in his character through those eight eight six episodes six episodes is beautiful um not always easy to watch but he plays that role with like a thousand hearts in one and I was like almost brought to tears and he's in our interview with him which is the first interview you will hear he brings that he talks about that more and he talks about like what toxic masculinity means and how it affects pe- men you know so yeah we got to speak to them about quite deep issues and it's a compelling series and and I will implore you to watch it. So this will be our first interview. So our first interview is with um, Arnold Forslu, Rob von Furen, Yandre Leroux, and Sean Cameron Michael, who play Arnold, plays um, the main character, Lydic. Rob plays Swiss de Villiers. Sean Cameron Michael plays Arendt Brown, who is the villain of the series. I don't know why I said Arendt is actually not an Afrikaans character. I don't know why I said that an Afrikaans character. And Yandre plays Bals, who is like a Russian. He's also kind of a villain, but he, yeah, he plays a Russian character. Um, interesting accent work in the show as well. <laughs> so that's who our first interview with, and then you, I will pop back in to introduce the next part. And Arnold will be the first person that you hear in the interview. Um, so, what drew you to Ludic as a project? I wanted to do Ludic because I could act in Afrikaans, mm. and uh, yeah, that's why I did it. That simple, Afrikaans. For me, it was just an incredible script. It was like mm. uh, unlike anything I'd ever read before. Unlike anything uh, I think portrayed about South African culture and particularly Afrikaans culture. Incredible cast. Um, and for me, the role of Swiss was the opportunity of a lifetime. So it was a no-brainer, definitely. Draw card for me, same story. Um, amazing script. Afrikaans? Scripts. No? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> amazing scripts. Amazing scripts. Obviously, wanted to work with Arnold. Uh, we had worked on a show, Criminal Minds, mm. uh, in the States years ago, but we never actually had any one-on-one scenes. So I really wanted to, to work with Arnold on screen. Didn't want to work um, with us? Uh, yeah. Uh, and really wanted to work with Ian Gabriel. Um, um, you know, he's done amazing work, and so I was really excited to be working with him. And obviously Netflix. So that was that was mm-hmm. a big draw card. And of course Rob and Young Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah, for me, he doesn't need it. I've worked he with really this guy before. He's, he's crazy. But <laughs> for me, it was for me it was well. The draw card was Paul based. Uh, you know, producer. He phoned me. He said, "Listen, now I've written you something." I'm like, "No way. This is like wow. It's like hope." You know, after. Corona and all that stuff, picking it up. And I'm like, yeah, I read through this, the, the pilot seat, the episode. I'm like, I love it. I love this guy. I like doing accents or trying to do accents. I mean, I didn't know that you could read. And it was amazing. Yes, you did. not did you? But I got schooled on this. I got so schooled on this. Okay, now you need to keep quiet. <laughs> Hush. <laughs> So, um, when looking at all four of your characters, like something that came up to me was that there's a lot of toxic masculinity. Mm, toxic. Yeah, toxic. I mean. so, um, <laughs> but so, still love. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but how do you think, like, the expectations that are put on men and boys, like, to be a certain way affects the way your character acts in the series? With no spoilers. What do you think, Rob? Sure. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, I think it covers, it covers uh, masculinity and toxic masculinity in South Africa, and particularly in Afrikaans culture, uh, in a way that hasn't been done before. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I think Don's journey, you really, you really get a, a sense of understanding and empathy for how he has become the way he is when you see that backstory in them as children. Obviously, my character, Swes. Is is very much a victim of of that toxic masculinity. He's, he's been bullied his whole life. He's never been uh, big enough or man enough to fit into this this family that he so desperately wants to be a part of, uh, and even just the culture. So I th- uh, I, I think in, particularly in that kind of family dynamic, it's it's very very rich and it deals with mm-hmm. it in a way that's 
very honest uh, and very raw. And, um, you know, you also see it in, in um, Kleindan's character and the relationship yeah. between, between the two of them and then Uncle Swayze coming in and kind of relating to him as a kid that's being bullied and that mm. can't kind of be the man his dad desperately wants him to be. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think it covers a lot of that in a very, very special and um, real way. I think it's a great question because, I mean, I think with all these characters, you know, they're damaged. I think it was a great answer. Mm. First <laughs> that was a great answer. That's why I was going to say, whatever Rob said, just take that. But you know, these guys, but, I mean, these guys are damaged, you mm. know, and, and this show shows the, their vulnerability and how damaged they are and the stupid choices they make and the consequences of that. Mm. And, and we so bodies have to deal with this, their stupid consequences. Yeah. I mean, you know, so so maybe maybe it shows the audiences, <laughs> you know, that maybe they make the wrong choice. Yeah, yeah there were tough yeah. days on set with the masculine stuff, but and Yandre recommended that, that we wear women's underwear, but we yes. couldn't go. <laughs> We yes. couldn't go that far. It was too method for did us. Did you guys so, not do I it? Could, we could I, did, I did it. I, I am. I am. <laughs> yeah. um, so, when, you know, other than the toxic masculinity thing, when you guys were researching or creating your characters, what were you inspired by? Or who were you inspired by? You know, when you sign up to do a film, you you look for inspiration everywhere, whether it's in the drive to work or the song playing on the radio mm-hmm. or the garment you're wearing that day, you're desperate to find something that'll inspire you. Mm-hmm. So it changes from, from gig to gig. But what was so good about Ludic were the scripts. You know, mm-hmm. you're just as good as your script. And from the word get-go, and I'm talking six years ago when I started reading this, um, they were good. The scripts were very different and very good. So mm-hmm. I knew I had a shot of, of doing something unique because the script was good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the characters on paper are really very fully formed. They kind of jump off the page when you read them. And that was, like, you, it's very seldom that you get a script that that's kind of that rich and complete. Yeah, so it, it really felt like it was just all there. Yeah. It was just, our, you know, now we mm. just must hoi, and we did. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, I've played lots of baddies. So, you know, every time that I get the um, fortune enough to actually get a job, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to bring something, f- something fresh, something mm. different to it. And, and specifically, I mean, like, that's with my character. It was originally written as a dodgy South African businessman, and we decided to rather make him an Irish businessman um, who's involved in the, in the underground. Bec- and it's also because it was for Netflix. Mm. You know, you've got 200 million viewers out there, and we wanted to give it a more of an international feel for it. So having throwing an Irishman and a Russian into the mix yes, sort of... Mm. You know, mixes mm. things up. And yet it still feels very authentically South African, very authentically mm. Pretoria. Yeah, but it has it has this there. global appeal, I think. Yeah. Pretoria. Yeah, and the story is just so so gripping. That's what, what I loved about it. I could um when I when I read it, I'm like, Yes, I wanna be part of this. You know, this is inspirational, this is just getting to do accents and just that kind of stuff. I love it. Like I mean, you obviously, I mean, like, you weren't, like, let's say, my first choice, but, I mean, you looked great. Yes, luckily, you <laughs> didn't make the yeah. decisions. I, he, I mean, you, you, literally, you literally just, you know, <laughs> took his shirt off, and I was like, okay, cool, done. <laughs> With his female underwear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely you to meet too. you. Thank you. Our next interview is with the women of Ludic. So we chatted to Aneli Mdodo, who is the executive producer of the show, um, Tina Redman, who plays Lil, Inga Beckman, who plays Rina Huesen, and Diane Lawrenson, who plays Anit Ludic. I love your beret. Yes. Oh my God. Dusty pink. Always pink. I love yours too. But, um, so a question for all of you. What drew you to Ludic as a project? The people. For me, Lyric is all about the people. The actors, the the creatives, the executive producers, all of them, the directors. When Paul initially contacted me, I was like, I'm in. I didn't even read a thing. I didn't see a script. I was like, I'm in. It was the people. 
So um, for me, I'm one of the producers and Paul is my business partner, so is Frankie. And this is a story that Paul had been trying to get going for a good 10 years. So when we formed Rose and Oaks, which is a production company, and we, had, we all came with like slates of things that we want to do, because we've done a lot of things, we've done talk shows, we've done reality shows. And, but this was our, our, prized, our prized cow, like it was the holy cow. And everything we did, any money we made elsewhere, we always knew that we wanted to take it towards making sure that Ludic happens. But also we were very careful about uh, wanting to keep the story pure so we couldn't just go to anyone. Yeah. For and that's why Netflix was the perfect platform because they're all about the creative of something. Because And that's why their shows have done so well. You know, No one wants to like dilute it. Oh no, make it you know, palatable for this audience and that audience. And if you watch Ludic, you're going to see it's so raw. And the beauty of it being raw is that the performances... All you needed was a script, performances, and direction, and then magic happened. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, you know, these three ladies, yo, they just, they come, they come alive. Like, I know their lines. Like, I saw them last time. I'm like, oh, I know a line. Yeah. Like, and it's nice that you can be, you know, a producer, but yeah. still fan out. Like, I'm fanning out because they're just so talented, you know? And I think they're going to win Emmys, and then they must know me. <laughs> you know, because they'll be closer to Beyonce, and I need somebody to get me closer to Beyonce. These are my people. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I think I did, it was just like an instinct thing for me. I was like, this feels like it could be really cool. And then once there, it was a similar thing to your, what drew you, it then just became this family that I just mm. absolutely fell in love with everyone. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with everyone. <laughs> but I think my, my, I, I was first introduced to my character um, before getting to read the script, and I was like this is a very cool character. I want to be a part of this. I want this. And then um, once I got the role, I got to read the script, and I was just, I was in. There was no getting me out of that. Mm -hmm. And then obviously meeting the people, the cast, the crew. I mean, it's, it was like a big family with a common goal, and it was just beautiful, yeah. So uh, a question I have is that, you know, Afrikaans television series tend to be like the more conservative. Mm. And you know this is very different. Like I mean, you're your, your first season, you're having a sex scene. You have obviously BBS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Guilty. And, you, know, also, like, you, you know all these things we don't mm. use. Yeah. So how do you feel to show this different side of an Afrikaans woman? Can I start with that? Yeah, sure. I I I, um, you, uh, uh, I don't <laughs> think it necessarily showed the the, the 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 in the opposite side of conservative. I think it showed like like real. Mm. You know what I mean? It's it's not that like it's because a lot of conservative people have yeah. secrets and they have mm. certain kinks and they have certain tendencies that they're not willing to really discuss. Mm. In, within the community, so I don't think it's necessarily like this crazy story. I just think it's showing like real people processing their sexuality and processing their, I don't know, moral rudders and re, mm. you know, mm. it's real. It's real. It's real. It's what yeah. people are like. For me, it's it's exciting to see it to see Lyric in Afrikaans like this mm. because. The, Afrikaans people watch international shows with the same kind of relatable yes. human content yeah. in it. Yeah. And it has always fascinated me that we are not showing that in Afrikaans, mm -hmm. which is what we're doing now. We are making, uh, we've made global content that can be related to anywhere in the world. It's just in Afrikaans, which is exciting. It feels like it's just pushing the envelope a little bit in where we should be going. Yeah. In my view, anyway, with Afrikaans content. I completely agree. With what, she said. Yeah. what she said. Yeah. I just also believe that everyone thinks they're conservative because yeah. it's something that you want to hold on to because it's almost like your, your moral compass. And as soon as you lose that, you feel like you're going to lose all control of what... You, you know, you're supposed to keep intact as a legacy. And, you know, with Afri I'm Kosa, and with Afrikaans people, I always feel like the closest beings to Kosa is Afrikaans people. We really have such similarities. But also, we, we think we're conservative until you're not conservative. And then when you're in 
this moment, you're like, oh, I actually like it here. You know, everyone has a vice. I just always say, don't practice two vices at the same time. Mm. Otherwise, you're fine. And other, in, other vice. <laughs> <laughs> and in Lydic, all the characters are losing control. Yeah, of exactly. Yeah. What they hold so close exactly. to who they yeah. are. Like, this is, my, this is my moral compass and I can't... And, and that's the thing is that it's such a... And that's life. And that's what I love yeah. about Ludic. It's life. It's a slip... You know, it's a slippery, slippery slope. And most of the times we always yeah. just want to go look where we fell and not where we slipped, you mm-hmm. know? And I think Ludic is just what, like six episodes of showing us every possible avenue that we can slip at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and exactly. I slip. Exactly that. So, you know, going off what you're saying, like... This is such complex female characters, and you know, I mean, obviously, women are complex, as we as we've just said. But you know, when you know, as watching it, I was like, you know, I thought I knew who all of you were. Mm. And then, you know, as the episodes went on, like layers started be, like getting revealed. So when you just point at her, don't go, yeah. just, don't be scared. Point at the one that point at the one that betrayed all of us. <laughs> like we we were sure we were in with her. Then you're like, ah, oh, girl. Okay. <laughs> but um, but but like when you were finding inspiration for your character, what did you look at? Who did you look at? Like where did you, all, all of you, not just you. <laughs> well, uh, well, I mean, sometimes like what you mentioned earlier, like sometimes you you research your character and you sort of beforehand and then sometimes I do that but other times I just sort of I kind of just settle into her yeah, after I lean a while. into it mm. especially if you don't have the luxury to like ha- to, to be on screen the whole time you have to sort of drag that like I don't know you have to like cre- yeah. I don't know it, it's not something I can really intellectualize I think with Rina uh, Huesen she I just sort of stepped into her maybe I played a dimension of myself in a way, but um, not in that way. But um, <laughs> tell us more. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, I don't know. I just kind of found her. I, I didn't, I, I, I had a very typical sort of like Pretoria businesswoman mm. in mind, but I didn't play her on the nose. Mm. I played her. I, I, I played, I played something else that I can't put my finger on. I can't answer you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously, you want to create characters uh, that you that they're parts of you that relate to it, mm-hmm. um, and like Inga said, like parts that you can lean into that feels comfortable. But with Annette Ludic, uh, there was a volatility to her where she's desperate and open to mm. anyone giving her comfort mm. and finding solace in places that wouldn't necessarily be in her in her you know her comfort zone mm. so it's finding it's finding bits in the script that speak to you naturally it's finding bits that scare you and that pushes the character into spaces that become interesting for you you know so that you you immediately can relate but you also have moments of volatility and insecurity in a character that pushes you into into new spaces. Mm. Um, and I think for for Lil, um, what inspired me and like um, uh, and how I played her, I was really led by Arnold and what Don needed and the mm. support that Don needed. And so that's how I could create the character. I, I worked around what um, uh, what his basically what his character how his character was created and written. And I, I made sure that she was grounded. I made sure that she oozed confidence mm. and um, that was important. But that's yeah. interesting about the woman in Dawn's life because when Arnold and I started talking about the relationship, I said, the first thing I don't want to do is make this woman a whiny wife. Yes, mm. yes. I don't want her to be someone that's just in her like, where are you? Where are you? Yeah. Where are you? I don't want to, you know, and I think with someone like Dawn Ludic. He has selected women in his life that, that are, are strong. Yeah, and they've got like a temperament for it. Yeah, because your rhythm and him mm. was the same. Because even in, in in moments where Don is facing like you're like it's the end, he's not gonna make it out of this, mm. and he just calmly makes his way out of it, right? And you find that with all the women that are around him, like no one loses it. Like even when you're crying, you're crying mm. in a. I'm reserved, but I, I need to tell you. And what I found about your character as well is that you were always looking for spaces where it made you feel like you belong here. 
because there was a lot of you're not you, you're not from here. Yeah, we were like this. Yeah. So even like with Swayze, who is like an absolute rubbish, yeah. you know, yet he still belongs to the lyrics more than you do. Yeah, you yeah. know, and yeah, you just, like, yeah, you're like, oh, right. but I behave. <laughs> I'm behave. Like, look at me, love me, you know. Yeah. yeah. But it is it is that thing of of creating female characters that are three-dimensional, that are strong, that fit into the picture, that isn't the normal mold of, like, the wife, the housewife. The, not that there's anything wrong with that, obviously. I'm not saying that. But that there's other elements, and that kind of uh, complements Dawn. Yeah, it was like a c carefully curated harem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> Our next interview is with Zane Mies, who Seven Delan listeners will remember as Neville Mankis, who plays Brigadier Davies, as well as Chamanu Sebe, who plays Charles Tzike, creator of the show, and producer Paul Bass, and producer Frank Frankie de Toy. Okay, my first question is for Paul. Yes. So what where did the idea come from for uh, So the idea came from stories that you hear, right? You had a bra, you were talking to friends and you hear about dodgy things happening. And the original idea actually was called um, Tow Truck Mafia. That okay. was the original idea, which was a very dark and serious world. And I shared it with Marie and we started discussing characters and, you know, what this world looks like. And that's what formed... Ludic and the facade of the furniture store, etc., etc. So, just, and that's why you still see tow trucks in the show now because it's still mm. uh, it's still a big part of it. So, yeah, it, it came from uh, the original idea was tow truck mafia. Okay. Yeah. And for the rest of you, what drew you to the series? Uh, the paycheck. Uh, <laughs> I'm an actor, sir, <laughs> and <the> free lunch. <laughs> Ask an actor. Tell an actor this food. No, listen. Seriously, though, Netflix number one. Mm -hmm. An Afrikaans series on Netflix with some great cast, you know, mm -hmm. good friends, <clears throat> people I've worked with before, great directors, great script. You just couldn't say no. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I thankfully didn't have to audition. I, yes, I paid Paul to get the part. <laughs> yeah. He said, good for my CV. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that, that, that was the draw card mm -hmm. for one. And, and that's what an actor wants, you know. Um, to be on an international stage with a, a language of your own, from your own country, to tell a story that's from... Pretoria of the Oaks here, I'm sitting in between two Pretoria guys. Mm. And, uh, and, and just to work with great people, that's it. That, that, that's, that's an actor's dream. And I, I get to do that with Arnold Fossler, Dion Lawrence, and all of that on Netflix. Mm. International, 192 countries, and, you know, let's go and export this thing. I, I was very excited to be involved with that. Yeah, I, I mean, I co-produced with Paul, Paul on this. Uh, myself, him, and Anneli are Rose and Oaks Media. And uh, when Paul, when we started speaking to Netflix about Ludic, um, but that's what I loved. I loved the idea of creating this Afrikaans series, this world Pretoria that we are from, like seeing places that we know. I, I, when we see those highway scenes, I'm like, oh, the amount of times I got stuck in traffic there <laughs> and we're on, on that Air Brakfontein interchange, you know, like, and, and I, the first thing for me was that from the Netflix team is to say, because that's what the first thing is, they say, yes, guys, this is a, we are a global platform mm -hmm. and everyone will see this, but you tell your story. And I was like, I love that, you know. And when Zayn and them all came on board, I was like, this is the kind of story we want to show the world. We want to show the world Pretoria. We want to show it with these actors and these characters. Like, it's incredible, you know. Um, yeah, um, I want to um, <coughs> add on what he's just saying. Pretoria. Uh, Pretoria for me is an interesting place because I was never there. Oh. <laughs> you understand the history of South Africa. So it was an opportunity to come into Pretoria among the African-speaking guys, um, which is um, the current South African um, political, social, geographical situation. So um, it was more interesting for me to be able to be among the African speakers. Mm -hmm. When I come from, you know, like, as a South African, you know, you know the story. <clears throat> and so it's much more interesting for me to interact with the Afrikaners speaker and, 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 and the Afrikaners audience um, so that um, we become one. 
because South Africa has, ne has never became one like this. Yeah. And this one is actually the first one. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, it, then um, it, it, it gives more interest to me as an actor as well and as a, as a South African citizen being among the Afrikaners, speakers, actors, artists, Producers, mm. it was a blessing in disguise. I say, mm. no, this one I must take it with both hands. Yeah. And 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 then and then I must put the vice on it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so what, when I looked at both of your characters, I um, they seem to exist in like a grey area, like they neither all good <clears throat> or all bad. So how did you interpret your character? That's life, isn't it? No one is really ever black and white. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that's a nice thing to play as an actor, is yeah. when you have this duality that you can play off of. Everybody's got their little secrets. Brigadier Davis is a good cop, loves to do his job, <clears throat> but at home things aren't going well, and he's having an affair with the lady at the... You watch the series, yeah, so you know. Is, <laughs> <laughs> he's having an affair with these characters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but you've seen that, you know, so... That's how people are in real life, and you get to play that, and that's 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 just just lekker. You never ever just play the good good guy yeah. or the bad bad guy. There's always this grey area that yeah. everyone really operates in. I think that's how you wrote it. It's yeah, it's bad writing just to write <coughs> a one dimensional character. Yeah. Like everybody's got issues to deal with, so mm. it's better to have some a good guy with bad intentions or a bad guy with good intentions. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to watch. <coughs> yep. Yeah, you know, like the, the inner human being that is always good and bad. Mm. It doesn't matter what nationality. No. It's there's always good or bad, yeah. black or white, yeah. green, whatever. There is good and bad. Okay. So my, my final question. So what is your favorite scene of the entire season? Oh, oh you said no spoilers. <laughs> oh, this is going to be tough for me. <laughs> um, I, I, it's too tough to 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 just pick one. But what I am going to say, because I don't want to give spoilers, but. I, what I do want to say is there's a moment with Brigadier Davies that I'm surprised um, when I, you know, that like something gets revealed around mm. his family yeah. and, you know, it catches you off guard. Yeah. And the same with Charles, uh, Tumana's character. Like Charles, I think that's what's beautiful about both the characters that, <laughs> that Zane and, and Tumana play is that they help us learn more about Don Ludic and at the same time we get to know about them, you know, and their interesting pieces of the world. Um, yeah, I, I could not even ask you about that. Yeah. Yes. I, I loved Rob von Fearing's performance in this thing. I yeah. thought it was fantastic. I worked with Arnold before, I worked with Diane before, mm -hmm. but Rob von Fearing just kind of pulled that one out of the hat. You kind of got like, the boy can act, he's not just a comedian. You know, he can really, <laughs> quite, you know, I thought he, he knocked he, it out he, the park. He, he, he lived the role completely, and it was just great, yeah. Do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's true what he's is, is saying because when I watched, um, I felt like, yo, this guy is he's so amazing. He's, 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 he's at his best. I, I think, you know, like you can think like he's, he's, he's possessed. Yeah, mm. yeah. That's, that's, that's <laughs> he was possessed in the character. Mm. And of course, your stunt work was great. Yeah, yeah your stunt yeah. work is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> All his stunts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a Tom yeah. Cruise, I'm yeah. Cruise of Ludic. Yeah, yeah. 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 There, there are so many things. Yeah, the, the, the stunt and mm. other things. And 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 and, and uh, if I would talk about Arnold, I never knew him before. You know, like I, mm. I'm I'm not a good African speaker, so I don't watch much of the Africans movies or or, or series. You know, like uh, the television stuff. And uh, it's, 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 it's more like a discovery for me. And, and being on set with him is very intimidating. Hmm. Yeah, even offset. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's intimidating. So I was not very sure about who he is, what kind of an actor he was. Yeah. But we then, um, we, we, I, I, I then had to show myself on stage. Mm. You know, like in front of the camera. Yeah. And it's all interesting to see on 26 August on Netflix only, you know, what people think of Ludic and what their favorite characters and moments are. Mm. So ask me that question is like, which child's your favorite one? Yeah. All these characters are like, like yeah. mind child. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I look forward yeah. to people, you know, watching it. And if they like it, share it and tell everybody about it.
Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that was the cast and producers of Ludic. Ludic will be available to watch this Friday on Netflix. And if you're listening to this on a day that is not the day when we come out, Friday the 26th of August on Netflix. So this is Netflix's first Afrikaans series. And yay, we're excited. So... Leanne, let's get into our favorite segment of the week, Crushing On. What have you been crushing on this week? I literally, as you asked this question, I just wondered, you didn't speak about Never Have I Ever season three yet. Right? No. I know we spoke about it privately, but we have not discussed it on the podcast. That is what I'm crushing on. Quite honestly, it's all I watched this week. And it was amazing. So season one was really good, really different, but very intense because of all the grief and stuff. And season two was kind of meh. Like it was good, but it was very middle of the road. Season three was exceptional. It was, I laughed so hard for so many scenes, like Mm. laughed out loud, actual laughter. Um, The character development is amazing of like all the characters I am living for Trent as 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 all of it, just as as um Paxton's bromance buddy, um him and oh, what is her name? Um, and then his new girlfriend. Yeah. They get together and it's like at some point I literally turned to Steven as like they have the healthiest relationship in this <laughs> in the show, which is wild. Um it's just yeah. Season three of Never Have I Ever, 10 out of 10 recommend. It's it's so good. Yeah, that's that's what I'm crushing on this week. I, Eleanor, you, you, his girlfriend is Eleanor. Eleanor. Yeah. <laughs> for me, Never Have I Ever did not drop. I For all three, I've been loved. I love this show. I, without a doubt, if, even through her bad decision, I stand my girl, Devi. I love her. Um... And, but also, but it has been great this last season seeing her grow and, um, mm. you know, feel the consequences of what she's doing and, you know, and think through things smartly. I love the season two. I thought it was brilliant. I just, oh, no. And I'm a, I'm team Ben the and Devi, they... so I, I, I love the... Dude. <laughs> okay, yes. No, yes. <laughs> It, it, there was a moment because they, they obviously introduced a new character. There was like a third potential interest. And it was it was so wonderful, like watching all of it because I was like, oh, I love, I love this for her, like mm. finding somebody else because it felt like she was just going through the motions with between Ben and Paxton. But then I was still like, no, but but Ben and Paxton, like <laughs> it's still, it has to be one of them. And then, but also I I was, I said, I was, what sure, really sure you are. Was that they, <laughs> no, what I really enjoyed was that they they developed the other characters' arc so much more. Mm-hmm. So it was still a lot of Devi and Devi growing, but you actually got to see everyone else mature with her or go through things like without her, if that makes sense. So like Fabiola had her own plot line, Eleanor had mm. her own plot line, Paxton has hid like has his own plot line. And so it was actually just nice because you you what they've done so well over the last two seasons is invest you in the lives of the, all of them. Yeah. It's not just and my girl story. Carmela. But then <laughs> <laughs> Carmela finding her groove. I'm sorry when she moved into like the Hollywood hotel for children or whatever. <laughs> sorry, spoilers. But like so funny. It's just it the season is just so feel good and hilarious and easy to watch. I adored it i did want to see um if i have one gripe i wanted to see more of anisa um and i was i must say i was very disappointed that the storyline that she did have was dropped so quickly because i was kind of rooting for it i wish we could have a spoiler a, a spoiler um episode about this maybe we can we can look at that 
later um, on. Yeah. But uh, like a spoiler filled episode because what if people haven't seen it? Like me that still hasn't watched Stranger Things, um, the new season. But um Same, same. <laughs> but like so so at least not revealed too much. But I do I was a bit disappointed by that. I love Anissa and I wish she had more of a storyline the season. I do think it was weird because even when when they end so in the timeline of their high school journey this is the year before senior year so even as they were wrapping up the year I found it interesting that the the excitement for the next year didn't really include Anissa mm. like she wasn't in the scenes where the three where Eleanor Davy and um, Fabiola Fabiola discuss like senior year yeah um it's like that she's not in the group me, anymore. At some point I was like, and I was like, no, bring yeah. back Anissa. When are we gonna get two like an American show, like probably have two Indian girls in a group? Like as someone who is 14% Indian, I really felt <laughs> <laughs> represented <laughs> by that. And now I'm like, now now it's back to um uh, to Debbie being the token Indian girl in her group. And like, no, we I wanna see more. Uh, the great thing about Brooklyn Nine Nine was that they had two like Latina women in the show, like yes. in the group. Like it wasn't group like was you one, yeah, yeah, one token. Like bring back Anissa into the group, and I know she's like, no, she's gonna hang out to jocks. No, you can be a jock and still hang out with your friends. Team, bring back Anissa. That's that's my point that I'm standing on. Um, <laughs> I love her, <laughs> and I mean like a biracial, biracial. Sorry, bisexual. <laughs> Why did I say biracial? Bisexual Indian woman in a damn American show. When have we seen that? I'm trying to think. Oh, that girl. That um. No. No, I don't. I can't remember. Maybe there is, but I mean, like a teenage girl. Bend it like Beckham. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bend it like Beckham is the that last was, time we saw. That was it. That's, and yeah, <laughs> and I mean that's not like <laughs> that, that's just our queer reading of it. But I mean. I mean, when last, you know, it's a, for, for a, for a, bi- why do I keep saying biracial? For, I'm listening to Mariah Carey's audiobook, so I'm like, she keeps talking about being biracial. <laughs> so it's so in my head. A bisexual teenage, Indian teenage girl, you know, we haven't seen that before, and, and it would be great to see more of her character and more of her growing. Give her a spin off. Mm. I want to see her at college. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so for me, I, I got the privilege of watching the first episode of House of the Dragon on Friday night. By the time this episode comes out, the, the, the show will be available for everyone to watch. So it won't be so cool as, as it is right now. But So I watched the first episode of the, the Game of Thrones prequel show, House of the Dragon. I must say I was very skeptical because, number one, I was very low on Game of Thrones, even though I was obsessed with Game of Thrones. I was very low in it because of how bad the last few seasons were. Um, so I wasn't all that mm-hmm. keen. Secondly, not a big fan of prequel shows because I don't like knowing what happens in a show. And I was more keen for the other show that because there was a few um, Game of Thrones prequels, Greenlit, and there was one with Naomi Watts, which told like like mm-hmm. ancient times when the first men arrived. And I thought there wasn't there's not much we know about that. Even in George R. R. Martin's like encyclopedia and stuff, it's very laced over, and there's a lot of mysteries that we still aren't aware of. Um, whereas the Targaryen history is quite well documented. So there's a lot we already know. And I wasn't all that interested in watching Targaryens fight. So I, I must I must say, when I went into the show, I was like very meh. I watched the trailer and I was a little bit intrigued. When I watched the show as well, apparently the, the, the other show was scrapped because it was too different from Game of Thrones. This one is very reminiscent of Game of Thrones. You back in the Red Keep, you back in King's Landing, and you, you see all the... It's, political intrigue so in that aspect is very much like game of thrones but it's also it's a lot more focused because it's only on what one one central location and one family that it's centered around instead of you know game of thrones used to hop around to all the different parts of westeros so that's very interesting but for me what i liked about game of thrones also was the mystery so we didn't know about who exactly was the prince that was promised we had could have been daenerys it could have been Jon snow we didn't exact we didn't know how the white walkers came to be or how they were going to be defeated or what the mysteries around all of those things comprised of there were so many mysteries but yeah i feel like we don't have that same thing and i don't know they might still introduce it but i i was like uh, but i did enjoy the show like 
I was mesmerized. There was one point during the, the, the viewing of the screening where we were sitting at a table and the table decorations caught a light, but none of us noticed because we were so into the show. And then one of like the Sorry? <laughs> one of the ushers or whatever people that were security was like, um, and went to go put it out. We didn't notice a fire in front of us. That's how that's how intriguing the show was. So I'm excited to see what happens next. You know, Game of Thrones itself took a little bit of a while to get in, but the budget for this is a lot greater than Game of Thrones season one. So the dragons look amazing, the sets look amazing, the like you know the camera work is stunning. So yeah, I'm excited to see what comes, and maybe they will create sort of mystery that I don't foresee, but. If you like Game of Thrones, I'm pretty sure you will like this. Unless, you like my friend Danny, who hates the Targaryens, you're not going to like this because it's the same <laughs> sort of like dragons, incest, all the things that <laughs> that made. But it also, I mean, no spoilers, but I mean, because I have read the um, the encyclopedia and stuff, I kind of know what is happening. But if you enjoyed the whole Danny versus Cersei thing, there's a very similar dynamic, which is hasn't started yet in the first episode, but is going to happen in the show where, where it's two very strong women up against each other. And that is quite intriguing. And it'll be it'll be interesting to see how they how they pull it across and how they how they make it work. But yeah, so I am crushing on House of the Dragon, which will be available to watch on Mnet DSTV channel 101 from Monday, the 22nd of August. On that note, <laughs> we have a new competition available for our to all the afternators out there, I believe it's called. So the latest film in the hugely popular after series hits theaters this weekend. After after Ever Happy is a romantic drama directed by Castile Landon. The film is based on the 2015 novel of the same name by Anna Todd and is the fourth installment in the After series, following After, After We Collided, and After We Fell. In this film, a shocking truth about the couple's family emerges. Families emerges. The two lovers discover that they are not so different from each other. Tessa is no longer the sweet, simple girl she was when she met Harden. The film stars Josephine Langford and Hero Fiennes Tiffin, reprising their roles as Tessa Young and Harden Scott, respectively. The after series of books have been read by over 703 million people globally. The books were initially released on a free platform called Wattpad and have since been published and then made into films. We're giving you a chance to win two hampers worth 1,000 rand each, containing a deluxe makeup case, shopper bag, power bank, party light, notebook, and a pair of movie tickets, because the movie is coming out, to win, head over to our social media channels for a chance. Thank you guys so much for joining us for season three. We'll be back next week with a new amazing guest to chat and to chat more pop culture news and info. Today's episode is brought to you by Syntex. Syntex is a technology company that sources and distributes industry-leading products and brands from around the world. Me, you can find at Karen Walby on Instagram, at Karen Walby's with an S on Twitter, and sign up for my newsletter, Wildest Dreams, at wildestdreams.substack.com. The podcast can be found at Crushing on Pod on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. You can find us at What's IGN Crushing On on YouTube, and you can find more information about this and all our other episodes on our website, crushingonpodcast.com. Send any feedback to mail at crushingonpodcast.com, and you can send us voice notes at plus two seven seven eight three six two two five six six. Join our Facebook group, Crushing On Club, where we chat about the show, celebrity news, recommendations, the whole shebang. The show is produced by me, Karen, as well as Rebecca Barchers and Leanne Philipson. The show is edited by Rebecca Barchers. Our logo was designed by Nathifa Maruf, and the show was created in partnership with IGN Africa. If you like the show, tell everyone that you can, any way that you can. Keep up to date with episodes by subscribing to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate and review the episodes on Apple Podcasts, 
as it helps others to find the show. We'll be back next week with another in-depth conversation with a pop culture lover. See you then.